morning, everyone. Welcome to another Initial Greater Washington Frontline Conversation. We have with us today Gina Schaefer, the founder and the CEO of a few cool hardware stores. And I've been eagerly anticipating this conversation for quite some time because if you want to know what's going on in terms of the retail industry and what's happening out there in the street with everything that's going on, Gina is the one to talk to. So Gina, I'm thrilled to have you with us today. I just want to start off by asking, how are you feeling? How's your health? How's your family's health? What's going on? Morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, Health-wise, we're fine. My family is fine. My team is fine. Um, we have about 250 employees now, and so we work very hard every day to keep the stores clean for our customers and our teammates. So we're good. Yeah. So you did something uh, right before the pandemic hit. You acquired two more hardware stores. You're now in downtown Silver Spring, which is my baby. So I'm thrilled that you're there as part of that. Um, so talk to us about what happened when the word came down that everybody was shutting down and what impact did that have on you and how did you react? To that? Well, you know, the, the, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. The, the process of acquiring a new location or even building a new location typically takes anywhere from, you know, two to nine months, depending on the negotiations with the sellers. Um, and of the 13 stores we have, we've purchased four and they've all been very different. The experiences have been very different. So we had started working on purchasing these two locations. Uh, we purchased one in Petworth and then the one in Silver Spring. Um, we had probably started about six months prior to, to finalizing the, the, bit, the opening, the transition in January or February. And we thought it would be done before the holidays. And then I thought, oh, it'll be done in January. And then it just kept taking on and on, taking longer and longer. And the next thing I know, you know, we purchased these stores, we went to visit, we met the staff, we're talking about what a great company we are and the transition in the culture, and then screeching halt. And everything stopped. So uh, we, we were really fortunate to have two very uh, strong uh, team members who were transitioning into management roles at those two locations. Uh, and they hit the ground running. And they just basically took over the transition process without um, my husband or I or the back office team really going. We wanted to make sure that we weren't traveling to the stores um, and, and as much as we had been before. So it was, it was interesting. <laughs> so when things shut, what adjustments did you make in the store? Did you close for some time? No. So, you know, we were considered essential. Uh, hardware stores across the country were really, uh, we were concerned and obviously we were fortunate enough to be able to stay open and we can talk about the whole challenges that that, um, that, that brought about. But we uh, did not close at all. We immediately had conversations with our leadership team about what it would look like to stay open. Uh, we handed over the autonomy to make a lot of decisions. So the managers had the ability to shut the sh store on a whim if they felt like something was happening that was unsafe. Uh, they had the ability at, eventually to limit how many customers could come into the stores. So um, if, a, if a Petworth, for example, the manager felt comfortable with five customers only, we gave them permission to only have five customers in. And so it really restricted how many people were coming through the door, but it helped make everyone feel safe uh, pretty quickly. Yeah. Did, in, did any of your people get COVID? Yeah. So um, at our height this summer, we had 301 associates and we've had nine positive tests. Oh, yeah. um, in fact, I was telling Debbie before you got on, uh, just we had a positive test yesterday. And oh, right. the lesson for all of us, and certainly for my team, but for everyone listening, is that we can't get complacent. And we have that conversation a lot here in the stores. And so we can control what's happening in our in our locations while we're here, but we can't control what happens once someone leaves the, uh, the store, obviously. So uh, we, we talk a lot about, you know, this isn't over, don't be complacent. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know if nine of 300 is considered terrible or good or, but. Well, there is an obligation I think people have in, if they're an essential business, essential service, like um, healthcare workers, uh, senior living facility workers, all that to, be very careful what they do outside of the job, you know, because yes. some of these places, the only way it comes in is if you bring it in. So, Correct. So you've got to watch your behavior. And that's difficult for a lot of people to do. It's difficult for them to say, oh, I gotta, you know, I can't see this person, can't see that person. I've got to really moderate my behavior 24 seven, as opposed to just when I'm at work. So. Right. It is. I had an intern this summer who went back to college uh, where I went to school and the, the university's open. And so I've said to her all the time, you know, no fraternity parties, no yeah. after sports, uh, social hours, no happy hours, uh, you know, all of the things that all of the young people want to do and us, right? We're not young, but <laughs> that we want to do uh, that could endanger coming back into the, the business. 
So what's business been like since then? And limiting the number of people coming to stores. Um, so there, that cuts down on the number, on the number of customers. So have, yeah, we, um, we it's, it's, it's ebbed and flowed. So in the very beginning, it was, it was pretty calm. Um, people weren't coming out for the first couple of weeks. And then we started to see a really big shift in a couple of different ways. Um, E-commerce exploded for us. Uh, we were not prepared. So ACE is a co-op probably heard me say this before. So we're a member of the national cooperative and you can go to acehardware.com and you can buy something and pick it up at our store. Uh, that system was never robust enough to handle something like this, even though it's run by, you know, $5 billion cooperative. So that system was immediately super stressed. Um, our locations at the same time were also not prepared for the influx of e-commerce orders. So you think about, oh, how, how easy, you don't have to unload a truck or you don't have to really order the product or think about it, a customer requests it and it comes into the store. It seems on paper that it should be really easy. Well, it might be something oddly shaped. Um, you have to have a place to put it before the customer comes and gets it. And so we had entire sections of our stores. The Old Town store was a really good example of, um, it had to shut down its entire workshop. So we were no longer offering any of our services because they just needed storage for all the e-commerce orders. So that was, that was part of the challenge dealing with that. We had to deal with, with communication issues. I had never thought about this prior to uh, the pandemic, but our phone systems maybe take you know six calls um, and 100 people a minute were trying to call us. They wanted to know if we had things that they needed, whether they were essential things or not. So we uh, immediately uh, instituted a um, texting app at some of our locations. You've probably interacted with a text bot at bigger retailers, but we had never considered it for our locations. Uh, so from a customer service standpoint, we had to do a lot of a lot of changing. We teach our associates to walk a customer to the aisle, maybe to take Doug's phone and look at the project you're working on so that we can help you figure out what widget you need. Well, you shouldn't touch Doug's phone anymore. And you shouldn't stand close to him. And oh, you probably shouldn't walk him to the aisle. Um, so we had, to, we had to really talk about and change how we offer customer service. We are held in very different standards, I think, than big box stores. And part of the, the beauty of being able to stay open is that people didn't want to go to a really big location. We found lots of people wanted to come in to a smaller space that they could get in and out of. But we really had to be cognizant of the, the um, heightened expectations, I guess. So can you talk a little bit more about the customer service? That's your great feature. I mean, you walk in a store and you've got people to talk to. You can assist you with any question that you have. Yeah. It's wonderful. And now you're, well, we can't really get close to you. So how, yeah. well, what's it, what, what else has happened there? What, how have you modified that to keep that level of service, but keep everybody safe? You know, I, the, my tagline is a few cool hardware stores. And I said, we officially became cool when we had to hire bouncers. So there was one point in the summer where we actually hired out of work bouncers to sit at the door at some of the locations to help control traffic flow. And I mean, maybe I'm being a little stereotypical, but I think bouncers are some of the most interesting people ever. They are, they are good at standing in one place for a long period of time, uh, which is not what I want my typical sales associate to, to do or to be like. Um, and they're really good at engaging customers. So one of our customer service tips when it worked was to have the bouncer um, sort of running um, crowd control and information dissemination before the customer even walked in. So if somebody wanted to go to the garden center at Logan Hardware, which oddly enough is in the back upstairs of the store, the bouncer would be able to say, you're going to go up the stairs this way into the back and this is where the product is probably going to be. And so we were able to give some information before customers came into the store. So that was one way. Um, we also, like I said, with the texting app, um, many of the locations had someone sitting at a desk responding to that text or answering the phone. We had never previously paid someone just to manage communication like that for us. Um, so that was something that we, we did differently. And then from an e-commerce standpoint, we launched um, a boutique website to sell some of the non-essential things. So if you think about it, you know, we, we pay rent on uh, square footage that has 30,000 items. Maybe 2,000 of them are essential, 4,000 of those items are essential. We couldn't tell you not to come in because you wanted something that was not essential. Uh, therefore, we didn't want to advertise all of the fun summer things we had, patio furniture, games that we brought in when no one could find puzzles. Um, those things certainly aren't essential to keeping your home, home operating. So we launched an e-commerce site so that we could uh, sell some of those things to customers throughout. So you, the two new sources you brought in in February of this year, how has 
you know, getting one of my big worries of, of the virtual world is that it's very tough to uh, share culture with people, with new hires and all that. How have you been able to work with that and, and, and to sort of bring them into a few for hardware stores and mode? Well, the first, the first thing was the, the ability that we had to take two seasoned managers and, and send them there. So the manager that started at Petworth, which was probably a really, it was a very tough transition for us, uh, to be completely honest. He has been uh, on our team for 11 years, 10 of them as a manager. And so he has lived and breathed our culture and our core values um, for a long time. And so sending him was, was really fantastic. Same with Silver Spring. Uh, Francis is the manager there. He's managed two startup locations for us, tons of energy, really enthusiastic, um, seems to get along with a wide range of folks. He um, has quite a few employees at Silver Spring who have been there 20 plus years um, and, and also had to bring in some new folks. And so he did a really great job of managing that. I think that's probably um, the first best thing that we did. And you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. We've certainly had lots of trial and error throughout the last several months. Um, and then we did a lot of virtual meetings. I mean, I know everyone's a little tired of Zoom or, you know, it, Zoom fatigue is a real thing, but we immediately got up to speed with Zoom. We started doing two to three time a week calls with our leadership so we could pivot quickly if we had to um, bring employees in, if there were folks on the floor who were just interested in, you know, I don't know why anybody would want to talk to me, <laughs> but somebody would say, you know, I want to see Gina's face or whatever. So we immediately had the ability to open that app and have a conversation. Um, and oftentimes it, it's just been as easy as, you know, how's your family or what are you seeing on the floor? Like, what are your customers saying that um, makes you happy, stresses you out? So we've, we've just, you know, over communicated. So you mentioned earlier, you had 300 employees, 300 people working with you at one point, and now you're 250. Have, have you moved people around from store to store? How's that? How, has anybody been nervous about that? Have, have your employees been nervous about coming to work in general? We, yeah, we've had um, varying degrees of nervousness depending on where we are in the phase of the pandemic. Uh, the nice thing about some of the government programs like the CARE Act is that if folks felt like they needed to take off or self-quarantine, they were able to do that. Uh, I've got several people out now because of childcare issues. And so because of the CARE Act, we're able to offer um, leave, paid leave and, and things like that. Um, we have a couple people in the very beginning. I don't have that many folks on our staff who fell into the age category that was, you know, the older age category that was the most concerned. But um, we do have some, and I had quite a few people in the very beginning take take time off. Um, I have a peer in Tennessee who lost forty five percent of his workforce um, because of their age during the, in this time period, which is, I mean, that is very very debilitating for a business that is now very very busy. Um, we were fortunate only to have about 2%. Um, and then we didn't hire for spring because we didn't want, again, we didn't want to encourage people. We realized fairly quickly in probably the end of April that we were going to be crushed if we didn't hire up with our spring seasonal staff. And so we went from about 250 to a little over 300, and now we're back down to about 250. So we've got a question from Mahan Tavakoli, our, our chair, and something that I want to ask as well. You've talked about the, the the techs, the uh, communications, um, the uh, e-commerce, how much of that is going to continue forward once, once people, you know, once you all have vaccines and nobody's worried about it, how do you think that's changed your business? I wish that I had a crystal ball that could answer that question. Um, I don't know. I and mean, we talk about it all the time. I think we have seen over the last couple of years um, a more of a, 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 requirement to meet customers where they are. And by that, I mean, I might be at home in my pajamas and it's 10 o'clock, but I'll get a question from a customer via Facebook. I might not answer at 10 o'clock at night, but I need to remember that I have to answer that customer via Facebook. So I think the ability to uh, meet customers where they are is gonna continue and be stronger. The question that we grapple with in the office now is whether or not, you know, we feel this groundswell of support for local businesses and We've always preached that, but now we feel it. So are people gonna to continue to shop with us versus a Home Depot, for example? I've got nothing against Home Depot, but will they continue to shop with us because now they've found us and now they realize that we can um, be as helpful or uh, beneficial as going to a big box store? But we don't know. I, I think we're not, we're not deleting the text app anytime soon. Um, we don't have anyone sitting at a desk now responding to 
all of these types of requests, but I do all the time. My marketing manager does all the time. So I don't know. That's a lame answer. <laughs> <laughs> Wish I knew. Well, everything's fluid. You know, everything's changing. It is. Every day. Is. So you just, uh, you've adapted so far. We got a question from Perry Pigeon Hooks about how do you approach training and reinforcement of your core values and your culture um, with your people? Uh, Perry, it's a great question. So um, we've had to do, like a lot of you, probably virtual interviews. We have always used our core values as part of our interviewing process. So we govern ourselves by things like always grow and share, be a good neighbor, be nice. Um, so it's, none of that has changed throughout the pandemic, except that we've asked those questions via Zoom or over the phone as opposed to in, in person. Um, training, again, has been mostly on the fly with the um, managers. So, you know, we haven't had the, whether it's a benefit or not, I mean, we, we can't work virtually. So if a manager hires someone new, whether they hire them over the phone or via Zoom, they are eventually going to be in the same space with that person. And so all of our normal training practices have gone into place. You know, we have what's called a training toolbox, and it includes things like scavenger hunts and product knowledge searches, and all of that has continued to happen. And then um, from a back office perspective, we just continue to do things virtually. Yesterday, I held uh, two Zoom training classes with two of the locations on our B2B program, and that was just me and some staff, and they were either at home or in a back office masked, um, and we just did the regular training just like we were in person. That's a worry of mine because we're virtual. We should be watching virtual. We're gonna be that way for a while. We're looking for a new development director now. And, and I do have that concern about uh, how do you acclimate someone? How do you uh, inculcate them with the culture of LGW when you're not able to to be with people. I mean, that's so much of what Leisure Grid Washington is. It's, it's right. Personal connections, the relationships, the bonding that goes on. So we're, we're all working through that. So. Uh, and um, Perry had a great shout out for your Tenley Town store. And we've got a ton of other shout outs in the chat room for a bunch of your other stories too. So Thank you. You know, Fragers turned 100 years old this year. Um, Fragers was the third store that we purchased when I was I think 35, that store had a milestone birthday. I don't remember what it was. And I sent the owner at the time a card and I said, um, congratulations, when we grow up and we, I think I met the store at the time that I was running, we want to be like you. And then, you know, fast forward 15 years, that owner who I had never met called and said, hey, do you want to buy my store? Uh, which was a super proud day for us. And then we turned 100. So we turned 100 in the pandemic. We planned on celebrating all year. We're famous for parties and gatherings and ladies nights and all these other things. And uh, we had to cancel all of that and change all of those plans. And so um, it's really cool having a brand that old, uh, whether you get to celebrate it appropriately or not. <laughs> so with the Mathis and Ed Warner giving shout outs to Fragers. Right I saw now. that, thanks. Yeah, that's great, that's great. So you don't have a crystal ball for how your business is gonna change, but you do seem to have a crystal ball for predicting what customers need. And, and talk about how you stock things and what were big sellers during the, the summer and what's happening now and, and where do you see uh, demand in the future? So this has been uh, fun, although super challenging. The supply chain has been stressed beyond belief. If any of you have tried to get a Lysol product or a Clorox product, I mean, those brands almost imploded. They just couldn't keep up. Um, obviously the toilet paper was a challenge at the very beginning. And so we started very early on talking about what we were gonna um, lose or miss, miss out on sales of. So what happens with the big boxes, and I'll use Clorox as an example, when they ramp their production back up, they allocate where they're gonna sell their products to. And so if Target and Home Depot, for example, are big Clorox sellers, they will say to the local Target, we are going to give you 25,000 units of Clorox wipes. And then Tenley Town Ace Hardware, which is right down stairs from Tenley Town or from the Target in Tenley Town, they'll say, we're going to give you, and I'm not lying, 10. So the allocation for small stores like mine from some of those bigger brands got to be so tiny that it was almost useless. Um, and so we really quickly started sourcing from elsewhere. So part of that sourcing process was also saying, okay, what are we going to run out of? In the beginning, very quickly, the moms were saying, we need to keep our kids uh, active and, and engaged. Holy cow, where do you buy a puzzle? Well, you couldn't find puzzles for the longest time, and we pride ourselves on selling 
all sorts of things. I mean, we're more of a general store than a hardware store. So finding puzzles. Then we ran out of seeds. So seeds and starter plants in the garden departments. We ran out of those things, which then very quickly made us realize that all these people were gonna start canning in the summer, in the late summer, in the fall. Where are we gonna get enough canning jars? Oh, and by the way, everybody wants to be outside because we're told that staying inside is not good for us. They want patio heaters and fire pits and patio furniture. So those things started to be challenging. Right now, really, the, the stress we're having is helping the streeteries, the restaurants that are on the street around the city, uh, find patio heaters and tents. Those are two of the biggest issues right now. Um, and I see that uh, continuing to be a stretch in the supply chain. And then beyond the patio heater, once you get it, you have to fuel it. So I think, um, I think getting propane is going to be tough. I said to Debbie and Chase, and maybe you, Doug, for those of you on the call who have a barbecue grill or your own patio heater, I would suggest getting an extra tank because <laughs> getting propane is going to be tough. It is going to be tough. And as you said, the, the restaurants, they're all outside now, the ones that are open. Right. You've got to have those heaters and propane and all that. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Anything else you, you see that we could be running out of or needing to replace? Uh, small appliances have been really tough. Uh, we actually, there was a national shortage for um, freezers, which we don't sell freezers, but there was a national shortage at some point in the summer because everybody was stockpiling food and, and like, or canning or buying, I guess, a side of beef. I don't know, but everybody wanted freezers and there, <laughs> there were no freezers anywhere. Um, so that was a big challenge, but on a micro level for a business like ours, uh, coffee pots and blenders, I think are the two next Everybody started making coffee at home. It's, I've always made coffee at home, so I'm always surprised at the people that only go to a coffee shop and get their coffee. And then when the coffee shop closed down, they freaked out because they had to figure out what kind of thing they needed to make this magic drink. Um, so coffee pots were very challenging to get. Um, electric kettles, interestingly enough, and I think those might see a resurgence of, of, of supply chain challenges in the, in the winter. And then I also, this is my funny prediction. I think everyone is going to be entertaining over the holidays and their blender is going to break um, and it will be hard to get blenders. So make sure if you're making frozen cocktails or smoothies, you have a backup blender. Are you uh, running a special on blenders right now? or is that No, there will be no sale on these items. <laughs> oh, oh, no. That's great. <laughs> We have a question from Terry Kenny. Uh, how was your profit margin held during these times, and what additional costs besides having, besides hiring bouncers and investing in e-commerce technology have you faced? Um, those are great questions. So there, our margins, um, our margins have held up pretty well, surprisingly. The the big stretch for our margin was when everybody needed and wanted PPE, and it was very hard to get things. So. Uh, just as an example, there were uh, boxes of um, latex gloves that we carry, or nitrile gloves. So nitrile gloves are less allergic, or they don't cause um, allergic reactions. Whereas maybe they would have been $7.99 pre-pandemic, our cost went up to like $22, which is significant. Um, so we made almost no margin on most of the PPE for a, a big chunk of time. And now we still have leftover product at those prices. Um, the supply chain has caught up somewhat, but we still have some of the older supply to catch so or to sell. Um, so that's that's been a challenge um, for us, margin wise. And then uh, what was the other part of the question? What other costs have you had? Oh, the cost. Uh, well, we instituted the texting app, which is $100 a month per store. So not significant, um, but you know it adds up. Um, we launched our e-commerce site, so we had some fees associated with that. Uh, we had to bring in higher priced items and things that we didn't, hadn't been carrying, which isn't a cost if we sell it. I mean, it's a good thing for us to do. Um, we had to hire some more folks in the back office to sit and answer phones, the bouncers. Um, that's probably it, actually. Do you still have bouncers at stores? Uh, Logan Hardware has someone who comes in on the weekends, I believe. Fragers has someone on the weekends. Occasionally, not all the time. Um, my Old Town Alexandria store actually has a bouncer who's a like 72-year-old who works there, and he's just really good with people, and he doesn't mind. So uh, technically, he's the bouncer there. So a couple, yeah. So what made you think of bouncers? What were people <laughs> sort of crowding in the store? They weren't observing social distancing. Were they not wearing masks? Were they angry that 
anybody would question them about wearing a mask? You know, we, it's, it's, we hear the, the complaints come from all different perspectives. So we'll get, oh my gosh, your store's too crowded, you're not being safe. Or, oh, the line is too long out front, we can't really win. And at some point, I think the city had said you should only have so many people in a space um, at once. And we just decided to make, I mean, my, my first um, job as a, the store owner is to make sure my employees are safe, right? If they're not safe and healthy, we can't welcome the public in. So we needed to make sure that if people were going to be in the store for eight hours a day, they were going to feel safe and comfortable. So we immediately instituted some pretty serious cleaning practices. Hardware stores are notoriously dirty. And I wouldn't say we let everyone get away with that. But when we really had to make sure that we were healthy, clean, a whole set of practices had to be started. And then fortunately, masks became mandatory. So even though we were wearing masks early on, it became mandatory and it was easier to uh, police, if you will, uh, that aspect of shopping. And then we really wanted to cut down on how many people that came in. And if, you, if we didn't have someone extra on staff, the cashier closest to the door had to do that job, which is really impossible to check the customer out, be safe, be clean, and talk to someone who's not supposed to be coming in through the door. It just, it wasn't working, so. So one of the things that we're hearing from a lot of people is that innovation really is ruling the day here, that we've got to be much more innovative. So who, I, I'm fascinated with this, who came up with the idea and said, oh, we need a bouncer at the group? How did that innovation come about? I mean, well, how, was that just popping your head or was that a long discussion? What happened? No. I, I mean, one day I just said, who is the kind of person that we would want to have stand at the door? And, you know, I hire people who want to run around the store, who have lots of energy and like are just physically active. And, and that putting someone on my staff at the door was not really working for a lot of reasons. And I just said, I bet there's, I bet there's bars that have bouncers that aren't working. And immediately we sent the call out and yeah, I guess it was just, it was one of those, it was kind of like, hey, I'm going to open a hardware store. I'm going to hire a bouncer. So I've always said, uh, I was the mayor of my hometown, Rockville. I always said being, everybody should be mayor of their hometown for a day. Be mayor for a day. How do I become a bouncer for a day? With, uh, a <laughs> come on over. You, awesome. Come on. Yeah, awesome. come on by. <laughs> we, have lots of, uh, we have lots of teammates who were once customers because they just realized how much fun it was to work here. So it happens. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So where do you think we're headed with this? I know you don't have a crystal ball in this, but where do you think we're headed? I mean, we're, we're saying... Next summer, hopefully, we'll be able to get back together because some vaccines will be out. And, and we've got other people saying it won't be till 2022. I don't know. I mean, I am at my heart a super optimist. And so I like to think that even if it takes another year, we will continue to become more and more conscious of um, how we should be acting and covering ourselves and, and people will continue to operate businesses as usual, it just we have something on our faces. I don't know. I think the next challenge that, that, so my husband, Mark, is my business partner, for those of you that don't know, and I think our next concern is when there is a vaccine, will we be able to make it mandatory? And what does it look like if it's not mandatory? Like, that's my concern. I'm not gonna be able to ask you in an interview, I'm assuming, hey, did you get inoculated against COVID? Um, but you know, how is that going to play out as a business owner? I don't know. And there'll be questions of, well, which vaccine did you get? And what's the effective rate of it and all that? And it's just, it's yeah. Fascinating. yeah. Even so, now we have the flu shot. We have a nurse coming to get flu shots in a couple of weeks. Yep. Um, and I, you know, you, you hear the chatter, like, I'm not getting a flu shot. I've never gotten one before. What I, why would I get one now? Like, anyway. Yeah, I, I gave up that argument a long time ago. Yeah. So just give me the flu shot. Yeah. So we have a question from Sylvia Henderson, with with your focus on the safety of your of your uh, people, what are you doing for the nice to haves for employees, personal development, mental health, uh, the higher ends of hierarchy of needs for future growth? Yeah, we um, so from a financial standpoint, um, we have been given uh, disaster relief payments, which are AKA bonuses. Um, for the last 12 weeks. So everyone on staff has gotten anywhere from $150 to $300 per paycheck and additional money. Um, so that's been really great uh, to have the ability to do that. Um, we also for 12 weeks gave everyone every single day $10 in cash. And we did that because we wanted them to support a local restaurant with, for, so it was lunch money, right? So they could use it for anything. Transportation costs increased and um, more people had to take Ubers because of the 
public transportation became a little unpredictable. Um, so the $10 was, was lunch money or travel money. Um, we did that. Um, in terms of you know, mental health, we have um, really spent more time talking about the, the, op the options that we have through our healthcare providers. Um, one of the stores has hired a nonprofit um, um, therapy group to come in and talk to the sales associates when there's been some just real serious stress on the staff. Um, so you've given the manager the authority to do those kinds of things on their own. So each store yeah. is yeah. each store is listening and adapting to the needs of their people. And, they have in responding. Them. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. 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 And you know, part of your you said sorry. earlier you you sort of push the decision making down to the manager. Is that part of that? Yeah, well, you know, we've been able to grow, I think, because we, we have always expected the managers to act like the owners of the stores, and we have respected them as the owners of the stores. And so, um, you know, I mentioned Petworth earlier. That's a really great example. There was a week where they were just really stressed, and I said to Noe, the manager, if you want to have two customers in that store at all times, that's your prerogative. And they did. They shut the door. They put a bouncer at the door, and they said, we're only going to let two in at a time. And that was really comforting for the staff um, because – I mean, just knowing they could do that, I think, was a comfort. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That would make a big difference. Um, are you looking to expand more? I mean, that's <laughs> do you have a hardware store for sale? Well, I don't, but they come up every now and then. <laughs> so, are we looking would to expand? Would you do that? Would you do that? If they were go for sale, would you go for it? If the Kensington uh, store signers <laughs> open up again, would you, um, would you go for that? Well, you know, Bill Hart is, is the store, that store owner, and he considers me his competition, and so I don't know if he would call me. Uh, he's amazing, and that store is fantastic. The nice thing about it being a co-op is that we all know each other, right? So whether we, whether we uh, some of us, some, not, ma, not me, think of it as competition. I just think of it all as one big rosy pot, but um, depending on our, our perspective. But yeah, we, we have always said that we will evaluate any opportunity. Um, Mark and I never planned on growing outside of the city and then we went to Baltimore and then we bought the store in Alexandria and now Silver Spring and so Tacoma Park obviously we're outside of the city limits now um, so we will we will evaluate every opportunity one of the ways we've tried to grow over the last couple of years is um, add-on services so Fragers for example has a rental business um, which we've spent two years now relaunching, revamping, getting the inventory better and, and newer. And then of course, rental just tanked during COVID. So the party supply piece of it, not so much the power tools and the, the tool rental, but we were just on the cusp, I think, of building that business. And I have said to, to Mark one day, let's not open a new store this year. Let's see if we can make the rental revenue equal a store revenue or, you know, some variation thereof. And that just went to hell. <laughs> So um, I have that to look forward to. I think post COVID, uh, we had to shut down our services at most of the stores, screen repair, um, glass cutting, things like that. And so hopefully we have that revenue to look forward to. So if we don't have any stores to buy or build, um, we'll be able to increase our revenue that way. The thing that we think will be interesting, I don't know if anyone on the call is in real estate, um, commercial real estate, the couple of opportunities that we've had recently haven't really been deals with the rent and we're really watching closely to see what's going to happen with all of the empty storefronts and whether or not the um, landlords are, are going to think about lowering rents in order to make sure that the spaces are full or if they're going to hold on to them waiting for some sort of bounce back and we don't know what's going to happen. So Gina, as I said earlier, we've got a ton of shout outs about your different stores, but now we're getting shout outs about asking you to buy other stores. So Ethan Seltzer wants to know how you can buy the store in Cabin John, Maryland. So. I know Ethan wants you to buy that store. I don't think it's for sale. <laughs> Let's go back to your history a little bit. You obviously were not, I assume you didn't grow up in a hardware store and this was your life calling. You were in the technology industry and then all of a sudden you said, I want to do that. What, what brought that about? What made you decide to become an entrepreneur and sort of put everything at risk? Um, well, one quick silly tidbit. I worked at a hardware store in my hometown, which is Louisville, Ohio, teeny tiny town, when I was 16. And I think I had forgotten that experience when I decided I was going to open a hardware store. But they only let the girls run the cash registers. So I didn't learn anything about hardware. 
I was like the cashier lady, oh. girl. Um, anyway, I lived in Logan Circle. I moved to Logan Circle in 1997. And for those of you who have been around and remember what Logan Circle was like in 97, 14th Street almost did not exist. There were three or four businesses um, and nothing else. I mean, it was, it was pretty bleak. And I moved here, I was commuting Doug to Rockville to work for a technology company. I hated my commute. Um, I was about to get laid off again. It was gonna be my third layoff. And so I came home from work one day and I just told Mark that I was gonna open a hardware store. And he thought I was crazy, asked me like, he asked me actually, he asked me if I was on crack, which we laugh about now because crack was a big problem in Logan Circle <laughs> at the time <laughs> um, prior. So why did you pick a hardware store? Why did, why did that come in? Uh, to, that's a good, really good question. So we, we were active in the community association, which was very strong. So there were a lot of people moving into Logan because the housing was affordable. Um, and the community association was very, very strong. I mean, at, at a meeting, we might have 100 members. And so it was very social. And we were always taking surveys. What do you want? What do you wish we had? What is the neighborhood lacking? And a hardware store always rose to the top. So I think maybe that had planted the seed. And I think also I had gone from um, the really, in my brain, impractical, magic startup world of technology. And I wanted something that was very practical. And everyone I knew was buying a, a fixer upper. Nobody wanted to go to the suburbs to buy hardware. But no retail experience before that? No, no not really. I'd always waited tables. Like, you know, you'd, college yeah. breaks, everyone would get summer jobs and half would go to retail and half would go to restaurants. And I gravitated to waiting tables. So it's, it's fascinating to me that you talked about the community association and they wanted a hardware store as top of the list. When we redid downtown Silver Spring, the community said, we want three things. We want a Whole Foods, we want a hardware stores, a hardware store, and we want a bookstore. Yep. And we got them, each of those. When we announced that Whole Foods is coming to Silver Spring, just the sort of the press announcement of it, 500 people showed up and gave a standing ovation because Whole Foods is coming to Downtown Silver Spring. Crazy, so, right? It is. But this, when we said Strohsteiners is coming, now it's you all. It's just, yeah. people love that. I mean, it, it really yeah. does fill a neighborhood need. It does. We had to, we had to um, we've only had to close one store. Um, so Logan Hardware turned 17 this year. So we've been in business 17 years, but we had to close our store at 5th and K, um, which was a good lesson. Someone, a mentor of mine had always said, you know, the bigger you grow, the more likely you are to have a failure and you can, you can uh, define failure in a, in a variety of ways. But that neighborhood really wanted a hardware store too, based on what we were told and all of our research. And it just, it didn't work. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have a comment from Sylvia Henderson, uh, correcting you a little bit, saying there was business on 14th Street. It just wasn't the kind that we were interested in. So. Yes, well, I used to go to Yum's every night after drinking. So we'd go to the uh, Vegas Lounge and we would dance to the music, which was phenomenal. And then I, you know, full disclosure, completely drunk, would go to Yum's and have a sandwich. <laughs> and I think we had studio theater, a pawn shop, uh, Home Rule had opened. He was a pioneer opening, you know, the new retail on 14th Street. So yeah, there was some stuff. Kay Sanders says he does miss his fifth and K store. He just Thank you. Comments. I know, I miss it too. And we have uh, another, we have a question from Sylvia Henderson now on, on talk about some of your mentors personal mentors, business mentors. Again, it's a, quite a change to go from a technology career to I'm going to open a hardware store when I have no retail experience. None. Yeah. I think, you know, I've always been, well, one super naive, which I think has, has served me well, to be completely honest. And, you know, if, if anyone did believe that there was a such thing as dumb questions, I've broken every rule by asking every possible dumb question. But I think in the very beginning, at least in the hardware world, I was introduced almost immediately to a group of uh, urban hardware store owners around the country. And they were so beneficial. Through ACE? Through ACE, yeah, through ACE. Um, so we have two conventions a year. Um, we have lots of affinity groups within the organization. And so the local, uh, the local retailers here in this region, we get together and, and learn from each other. Um, but Rick Carp in San Francisco was a, a, just a wonderful mentor of mine from the very beginning. Um, Israel Bloom in New York City. Uh, Jeremy Melnick and Les Melnick in Chicago. So people who had been in the business for a long, long time, who understood the nuances and liked the urban aspect. So ACE as a co-op is 
very hesitant in urban environments. It's a very old school suburban business, to be completely honest. And so I had to find my tribe early on um, of urbanites who didn't think that it was weird that we wanted to be in the city and didn't have parking and, you know, two stories and no elevator and all the craziness that we adopted. Um, so they were, um, they were very, very beneficial. Um, I would say from a culture and employee standpoint, um, I met the folks who owned Zingerman's Delicatessen in Ann Arbor, Michigan early on as a business owner. And I don't know if any of you know Zingerman's, but it is just a phenomenal business. And I learned a lot from how to build a culture and, um, you know, just grow employees and, and really started honing in on what we wanted that to look like. Uh, so they've, they were fantastic. And um, yeah, I mean, those, those, those two components and the, that those two groups definitely rose to the top. Uh, any leadership lessons you've learned over the past several months? Probably the biggest is, uh, is the ability to change. I have been so impressed with the small businesses who have pivoted immediately. Um, and I've been really impressed with my team, particularly the buyers on my team who were willing to look anywhere and everywhere to get products. And we never felt like we were stuck. Um, you know, we, we, we have a very small requirement of our purchasing requirements through ACE. And we are very, very loyal to the co-op because of the benefits the co-op provides us. But this was drastic. We needed to move quickly to get um, maybe in some cases a more local supply chain, um, local makers that we wanted to make sure we supported and, and boosted during this process. So I would say probably the biggest leadership lesson is not to be afraid of change or trying new things, especially in the face of adversity. I mean, if we had sort of stayed the course, I'm not sure what would have happened. Let me ask you, uh, if, if I could, it's a, you don't have to answer. It's a very personal question. I, I've never really done this in one of these conversations, but I, I would, sort of struck with, so to me, my calling was to be a community builder, to be a public service to people. And when I left in the elected office, I really sort of struggled a bit with consulting and other things saying, this isn't really what I'm supposed to do. And then when I got with Leadership Bay to Washington, it was, oh, okay, I'm back, I'm back where I need to be. I'm, I'm back helping people make the region a better place to, to live and work. So what kind of um, contentment, satisfaction um, do you get out of running hardware stores? What what, how does that drive you as a person? Um, uh, let me just tell you a story, if I could. Yeah. I have uh, uh, so many associates that I love. Teammates is what I, we call our employees. And so I have so many teammates that I absolutely love. And I have a teammate who celebrated six years clean from crystal meth about four months ago. And it was during the pandemic and I walked downstairs and I said, I, I just, I overheard him talking to somebody else. And I heard him say, you know, I'm celebrating my anniversary, but I don't think anyone's going to come to my party because of COVID. And I'm still listening. You know, I, 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 we have a culture here of hiring folks who are in recovery. And so that's a big, big part of our culture. That's very special to us. And the next thing I heard him say was, but I had people come from Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. And so he was thrilled and I walked around the corner and I said, congratulations, and I'm so glad your friends came. I said, how long did you, did you use? And he said, I slept behind a dumpster at Union Station and used crystal meth for 14 years. Oh my gosh. At which point I started crying and he's like, chill out, I'm fine. You know, <laughs> like his life just seems, uh, he thinks everything is so normal now. But I guess I'm, I'm telling you that story to illustrate that I get a chance to work with so many amazing people with so many great stories. Um, that it, it, that's what keeps me going. I mean, to be able to, and I don't even say, you know, give someone like that a chance because that just sounds so silly. Like to, to be the steward of the next part of his story is really beautiful for me. Um, one of the reasons we've continued to expand is I want to give more people opportunities. I mean, I think that's probably what you've seen going from government to leadership greater Washington. I have the opportunity to promote people to, to leadership roles. I, I have the opportunity to see people who never had a positive role model in their life all of a sudden become a leader or gain confidence or whatever. Um, and the more that happens, the more I learn and the cooler hardware gets. It's not about the nuts and bolts, right? It's about all of the things that the nuts and bolts facilitate happening. It isn't about the nuts and bolts. It's not, you, you're not getting sort of contentment from selling hardware to, no, to people. No. It's from helping people improve their lives and giving them a yeah. chance to, to, yeah. uh, 
to do better. And that's, you know, when I, the one thing I miss about politics, I miss the team of people I work with. They were great people. They just, I love being with them. Something new every day. And, and I think that's, that's exactly what you're talking about here. It's the team that you've got with you, that you put together, and the chance to even put a bigger team together and, and help, help work. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for answering that. I really yeah, you're welcome. No, thank you for asking. It's important for me, for people to know that those are, that's part of our story. Uh, I didn't tell that story or stories like that for a long time. And one of my associates one day said, if you don't, he said, if you don't talk about us, who will? And he is one of my teammates in recovery. And I, that was his point. And so I was like, all right, I can talk about this. But that was part of your decision making when you said, I'm going to open a hardware store in Logan Circle. You had a neighborhood that needed help. And you said, I'm going to be part of it lifting yeah. this neighborhood up and helping them out yeah and hiring some people to help do that it was always kind of there right my in one of my tech jobs it was actually the job where i met my husband i was i was called uh the cruise director because i was responsible for building the game room and spoiling everybody and booking the parties you know back when tech just had a bazillion dollars to do that kind of thing and i got to take what i learned there and transfer it to a, a workforce that never gets spoiled you know is, is never used to that, those kinds of things happening. Yeah, yeah. So we, we were able to do that, which was a really cool um, pivot to the, that skill set. So we have a question from Marguerite Roosevelt about your husband as your business partner. How does, how does that work? How, how does that, you know, what are the pitfalls or the good things about that? He's not here. I can say whatever I want. Uh, it's been great. So Mark and I met working at a consulting company. Uh, we did not work officially together at that company, but we were both there. Uh, I started the hardware store. He kept his job. He, he very sweetly said, honey, if you fail, I'm going to help you pay the rent on this place that you've leased, uh, which would have not happened because it was much more than he was making. But uh, three months in, he said, you're having too much fun. I'm going to quit my job and join you. And I said, that would be fantastic. Um, so that was April, May, about June of 2003. And um, we've worked together ever since. So the first year and a half, two years, we, we didn't do anything really back office -y. We were working in the business, not on it. So we were learning how to take care of customers and teammates and learning what the products were. And then the division sort of started to happen in terms of skill set. Uh, Mark is super financially savvy. He makes sure that we don't go out of business financially, thank goodness, because that's not my strong suit. Um, and then I do all of the forward thinking or um, public facing things. He, he, as much as I would tell him LGW would be phenomenal for him, he would never join. Like that's just not his wheelhouse. It's like, you let people see your face. I'm going to make sure that we don't go out of business. Um, so it, the, the challenge is that you go home at night and you have the same thing to talk about, right? I think if two people, if a couple comes from different jobs, you can, you know, hear about different characters and challenges and we have the same characters and the same challenges. <laughs> But we look at them in completely different ways, for sure. We're very different people. So um, it's, it's good. Yeah. Can I ask you to clarify something you said earlier? about sure. Commute to Rockville and how horrible it was. It had nothing to do with Rockville, right? No. Really, the commute and the traffic and all that. Rockville is a great little town. Isn't it? Rockville was great. <laughs> Rockville was great. It was really long. It's funny. Do you guys remember when, and maybe somebody, maybe this still exists, but um, I, I had this cute little two-seater car. So I stopped driving in 2007. We opened our Tenley Town location. I said, there's no reason. In fact, Ethan, smart aleck at a, an event at Riss's one day, said, Gina, because I also stopped drinking. He said, you only needed to stop doing one of those things. <laughs> so 2007, <laughs> I stopped driving. But I was commuting to Rockville in a little two-seater BMW that I loved. And I talked on the phone the whole way. And two months in a row, I had a phone bill that was $350. Like, I can't even imagine this happening now. And I mean, I guess I could afford it, but I was like, what am I doing? But I would talk the whole way there and the whole way back because I just hated being in a car and I hated the distance. And so, no, it had nothing to do with it. It didn't, I promise. I'm sitting right next to downtown Rockville right now in <laughs> my hometown. I, was I knew I'd say something terrible. No, no, no. I just, just wanted to clarify that for the audience. No, had nothing to do with that. So I, I also always ask, you know, you have any good news for us, but the, the story of the the passion or what drives you in the business. I thought it, was a, it, was, it wasn't a good news story. It's a great news story. That was really powerful. So thank you for that. Thanks. I appreciate that. Any LGW members that have reached out to you or you've reached out to during this pandemic to, to help? Yeah. I mean, lots. Thank God for Valerie. She got me hooked on Orange Theory right before the pandemic. And so that's made sure that I've, that I've stayed healthy. Valerie, uh, my, Valerie Clark. Valerie Clark. Yeah. My friend Terry from my class. Um, Terry and I walk almost three and a half miles every single morning. 
um, including the weekends sometimes. And so she and I have been each other's sounding boards. You know, she's at, um, uh, oh my gosh, she's gonna kill me for just, I just <laughs> Terry, Junior forgive me. I, Junior League? The Junior League of Washington, <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so uh, that's Remember. been super helpful. Um, Juan Hara, who's also in my class, is a, a very good friend of mine now, and he's been a, a huge, um, you know, just sounding board and ear when I've been stressed. And so, yeah, I've made lifelong friends that have been really beneficial. Yeah, and it is very beneficial. It's really amazing how uh, you can just turn to person after person in the Leadership Great Watching Network and, and get advice, get guides, or just vent if you want to. Vent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't want to vent to my team, right? They want, I want them to think that everything's fine and that we're, we're stable and rocks and, you know, I'm never stressed. So somebody has to listen. So uh, my parting word or my last word is everybody go out and buy a blender, buy a coffee machine <laughs> and stank up on, stank, stank. <laughs> uh, build up on propane tanks. Yeah, what's the word? Stack up. St yeah, <laughs> stock up, stock up. Stock uh, up. Well, Along no, those lines, I'll give it to you now for your last word. Well, I say my last words, I think, go along with that to the extent that I can entice everybody to really, really, really shop local and spend their money locally. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is for my team to know that the customers want us to stay here. You know, we, the Fragers anniversary was not about Fragers. We celebrated all sorts of other local businesses like the toy store on Capitol Hill and local bars and restaurants and, and bookstores. And we want everybody to to stay in business. And so please, please spend your dollars at local businesses, if you can. We appreciate it. Gina, I can't thank you enough. This, is, this has been uh, amazing. Thanks. I could do this all day with you. <laughs> really, really. Thank you. Enjoyed it, and we'll have to do it again. I would love to. Not too, not too far away, so. It's fine. Thank you, you so know. much. Thank you. Everybody, have a great day. I want to thank PNC Bank for, got a problem with the A-N-K words today. I want to thank PNC Bank for being such a great sponsor of these frontline conversations. And I encourage you to, to look forward to our uh, upcoming events. We've got a, um, one next week with um, Nikki Gorin from uh, the Meyer Foundation. So thanks everybody and have a great weekend. Gina, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.